thanks. As you know, I'm Yanis. Um, I'm on the Swift Server Workgroup. As of recently, I'm also on the Swift Android Workgroup. Uh, I'm a maintainer of various Swift packages across the ecosystem. And basically, the only thing that I do is not Apple. Um, as of recently, I'm building a uh, new operating system called EdgeOS. And EdgeOS is an embedded Linux distro, which really plays into all of what we have been doing so far with for those unfamiliar, um, if you're working with uh, an embedded Linux board, say a Raspberry Pi, today the story is very, very difficult. From picking your own operating system, picking all the components, picking you know a, a programming language, nothing is standardized. Not even open telemetry is standardized. So we're trying to fix that with an operating system, and part of that is building networking components because all uh, a lot of embedded components and IoT components are basically IO driven. And Swift is great, insane for, concurrent, uh, for IO because it has concurrency. And with a new feature called span, um, we're gonna dive right into why I think this makes a perfect combination during next IoT or embedded. So when I think of network, I think of a bunch of things, a bunch of protocols. And today I want to zoom in a little bit into something called TCP. So TCP is at the heart of uh, is very well uh, supported in the Swift ecosystem. So let's talk about the fundamentals of TCP. So uh, TCP has a, uh, you can see, it, it's a pretty high overhead protocol compared to UDP. Um, so if for those unfamiliar UDP, you just send some basic packets back and forth, uh, but it doesn't have any guarantees whether or not your data arrives. Sometimes that's desired. Like when you have a Skype call or uh, back in the day, uh, order of audio calls, they were sending UDP packets back and forth all of the time because when you have a bit of when you have a bit of a slow connection, you don't want to lag behind and hear your hear what someone said 10 seconds ago or a minute ago. You want to catch up to the right now. Um, but TCP is pretty interesting because it also it, it guarantees the delivery and order at the cost of some performance and the fact you have to catch up and it's ordered, so you know your packets are uh, your data is being uh, arrived in sequence which makes it great for reliable streams, databases, your HTTP web server, a variety of things. Um, but if you look into TCP in particular, uh, on the top right, there is something called the total length. Uh, this is a TCP in, uh, IP packet, so your packets can only get so large. And if we zoom in a bit lower in the TCP section, there are two properties on a TCP packet, which is the sequence number and the acknowledgement number. Um, TCP sends uh, your data in order and it uses the sequence number to, uh, to order the packets and know when something is not arriving in the right order. And then the acknowledgement number is sent back to say, yes, I've received this data. Um, if data is missing, then you send the old sequence uh, acknowledgement number back and you say, well, I, I only know up until here. Let me know if I missed something, if something went out of order. If you don't send an acknowledgement, then the other side assumes you're like, you haven't got the message and they repeat. Um, let's look. So this is a basic TCP flow. You don't need to remember all of this. Um, basically, at the start, you have a SYN uh, connection, which is a SYN, and the other side accepts it with an ACK, uh, uh, with an acknowledgement. And they say SYN ACK to say, yes, I also want to establish we're accepting your connection. And um, the SYN ACK, they go back and forth, and every time you send data, you have to acknowledge it. Um, this data has a small limitation though. So, uh, actually let me go forward. So if you, if you look at the, uh, the packet over here, uh, you have a window size on the bottom right, which says, I'm willing to accept up to this much data. This protects you from being DDoS. Now, this feature is here to protect you in more than one way. It allows you to, to pre-allocate some data in your, in your TCP stack. You don't notice this in Swift up here. It's just some underlying knowledge. Um, and the idea is that once this uh, window fills up, um, you're full, you don't accept more data, the other side has to wait. So if we look at Swift Neo, uh, it is really, really helpful when it comes to TCP. Like there is some, there's a feature we'll get into in a little bit why this is really, really important. So let's look at Swift Neo TCP. So there are really four steps when creating a TCP socket in Swift Neo. The first one is you create a bootstrap, um, the second one is you configure the bootstrap, which is, I, the bootstrap is basically I want to make a TCP server or a TCP client. Configuring it is with what properties, what protocol you want to talk. The third one is 
um, I want to establish, I want to use this bootstrap to actually create uh, the channel. Um, so the bootstrap is more of a template for getting connections and the channel is the connection itself. And then the final part is you want to bridge it into concurrency. You can use all the nice stuff that Swift has. So if you look into how that works in Swift, it looks something like this. So first of all, you have the, uh, the, the bootstrap on top, they're color coded. Uh, we configure it with our channel options and a protocol. Uh, in this case, we don't have a protocol, but you would add your HTTP protocol in here. Any other handlers, Valky uses their protocol. And then you want to connect it to a host to kind of like get a connection. And then the fourth part is what I find is really cool. You can do nowadays, you can wrap it into a Neo async channel. And then basically all the magic happens for you. So uh, TCP is normally really hard in Swift Neo. You have to manage a lot yourself, but with concurrency, things get quite easy. So there, there's one detail, which is your protocol stack has uh, some messages that you want to send, the inbound and the outbound message. Inbound is what you receive and outbound is what you send out. So for an HTTP client, you send out your HTTP request and you receive an HTTP response. For the server, it's the opposite way. Okay, let's dive in. So uh, we've discussed the TCP spec and uh, you know how, we, how you can write it. And of course, there are these ports that you know in the TCP spec, ADS, HTTP normally. Uh, and we've talked about the uh, window size. So, like I said, data is sent up to the window size. That means that uh, um, you, can, you cannot provide more data once that is. And um, in a normal, like, POSIX socket, in, in normal networking in your operating system, you, your, your, your write will be blocked or rejected by, the ser by your kernel when you, uh, you know, you're not allowed to send more data. So when it's full, no more data is accepted. You have to deal with it. And uh, the window can grow again when you, when you read the out data out of the window. So uh, this is really cool because, uh, where is it? Um, because the window size exists for both sides and you need to read and write. When the window is full, and no data is accepted and you can grow your window. Uh, so, like I said, writes are blocked when the window is full. And in Swift, Neo, Swift we don't want blocking, right? We have, uh, we have concurrency, we, do, we want to suspend. So this is, this is what a simple echo client looks like in Swift Neo. And uh, you, you, we have created the channel a couple slides prior, which is called an async channel. We have this execute and close block within which we have a connection to the server. And then we have this inbound and the outbound for, uh, parameter. The inbound is an async sequence, a stream of data, and the outbound is where you write your data. So um, if you, um, if you, if you read in this example, we iterate over the inbound and every time new data comes in, the loop triggers with the message, the for loop. And then if no data is, any, is accepted anymore, the for loop ends. And this kind of closes the connection. This cleans up. And then within the loop, we write data to a socket. So this message here just echoes binary data back. But if your inbound and outbound are not the same, you can't write the same message because the types need making those mistakes. So let's look why, why back pressure matters. This is a basic example. In this example, the, um, there, there's a proxy in the middle like, uh, anything that accepts data, and it wants to send it to another piece. Uh, this, the left-hand side could be a database where your data comes, originates, like a row of Postgres records. And then on the right-hand side is someone that wants to accept data. So um, maybe you want to download the whole database as a CSV. So what you want to happen is that um, as, as your client, as your, since the client is slower than the producer, so you have a, a client that downloads a CSV with one megabit per second, your database is much, much faster. Right? It might be two megabits. Um, the problem you might start facing if, you are, if you're not careful in most programming languages is that um, your server starts buffering this data. So it gets data at two megabits per second, but it can't release it to the client, so it's one megabit the other way around. So there's one megabit per second that's just stacking up in your memory. And if you're not careful about this and they're disproportionate enough, your server will overflow with memory, it can crash, uh, it might go uh, allocate, uh, it, might, it might do uh, swapping, and that's not good for anyone. Um, 
So what Swift has is uh, built into the language or into concurrency is something called back pressure, where as the client or the other side stops accepting data, the wait keyword kind of allows you to propagate that upward. So inherently, when you, you stop being able to write data in this example, um, the when, when the client is unable to accept more data because their internet connection is too slow, your write will be blocked by the kernel. And what this does for Swift Neo is the await keyword will suspend your further action. So this will kind of block your, or block, suspend your code until uh, the outbound is willing to receive more data and has more data. But that also implicitly uh, prevents the loop from iterating another time. So uh, by not being able to write more data, you're also not reading more data. And in a really nicely designed Swift ecosystem, that means that all of your components are in, in fine-tuned, right? Like you don't, without you actually noticing, your Hummingbird app is doing this in the background and nothing is uh, being bottled up. So this is really efficient for memory and it kind of feels like magic. If you look at the Hummingbird, if you look at Hummingbird, for example, here we have an example of what I just described where we have a database call where we want to fetch our records from the database. We convert it into like a service of events, a stream of day, binary data, and then we return that stream of data to Hummingbird to, to, uh, to send to the client just like WebSockets as well. They're just streams of data. And Swift models is excellent, which I think makes it so good for, for services. Um, my take is you should always use concur uh, these concurrency streams in your code bases when you're handling. This talk is not just about concurrency, it's also a bit about spec. So building networking libraries with spans and concurrency. For those, that, for those that do Swift and have been for a while, you know that Christmas comes twice a year. Once when Swift 6.2 comes out, and the next Swift 6.3 half a year later. Every half year we have another Christmas, and I think it's more important than data. This is when our goodies drop. So this year we had two, two really important types that I think are really, really cool, uh, and I know that Ben talked about them earlier today, which are inline array and span. So he covered span a little bit, but uh, span is a really interesting type for the ecosystem for a couple of reasons. First of all, it works on any bag of bytes. And we'll get into what bag of bytes types are in a bit. Span is read only, so you can't read to it, uh, write to it. There's mutable span if you want to mutate something, writing back into it. And finally, there's output span. Output span is kind of like a global collection of data, like it's like up, uh, it, it's like you can append data to it, just like an array, but it has a limit because there's a capacity you have to define at the start, which makes it so that you, can't, you can grow it up to that capacity. If you grow beside, beyond that, your application will crash, which is not what you want. So for the purpose of, of this talk, uh, I'm not gonna cover output span because I don't think it's quite what we need yet. So how does span help? This is a typical flow in a Hummingbird or Vaporweb. Your request has some binary data called a in a byte buffer, and you want to decode some data like JSON. So what you do is you convert it to data because foundation only supports it, and then you put the data into the parser. Now here we are making one copy from byte buffer to data, and then data gets decoded into a struct, which kind of makes another copy. And then finally we make our response, which is the logic of our route, and then we have to do the inverse plot. We encode our JSON, JSON to data, uh, our struct to JSON data, and then we have to convert it to byte buffer, buffer back so we can write it to the socket that Vapor and Hummingbird do their thing. I think it's a bit of a waste, especially in some circumstances. Um, and uh, when you look, care about benchmarks, um, this is like not what you want, right? You don't want to do double the work for everything you do. So if we want to be a faster ecosystem and we want to be faster than we are today, um, we want to eliminate the step of copying data. And I think span is really interesting there because you skip a step. Um, span allows you to get, get a view into the byte buffer and suppose that JSON encoder and decoder support spans you only really need to read the span. And it doesn't matter where the span comes from. It could be byte buffer, it could be data, it could be an array. And then the last part is you write data back. So, so in, a, in a perfect world where everything is ready, um, we, your JSON encoder just produces data, but the data that you have can be provided to Hummingbird or Vapor. And they just write it, they, they can use the, the data just like that because they can read it as a span, right? That's a bit of a perfect world, but we're not quite there today. And these are the bag of bytes types that are all around. Uh, for those 
who use um, Swift on server already, you know the byte buffer technology. It's all around. And for those that use iOS, they know data. But today, um, there's, there are very few libraries, if any, that support both native currency types for, and, uh, for all the platforms, like iOS, Linux. And on embedded, you don't have byte buffer or data, so you have another type entirely. Um, I'm part of the Android work group, um, so I care about this cross-platform compatibility. And at Edge, we care about embedded Linux. And we also care about embedded Swift. So what we do for embedded Swift is we try to provide uh, support for ESP32s. And ESP32s, they have uh, a very limited amount of memory. They have, so you can't waste this space. And I want my libraries, ideally, to work on all platforms all the same, at least at the, at the high level. I don't want to write my code five times for each platform. That kind of defeats the point of why I'm using Swift. So we have this bag of byte type. We have byte buffer for server. We have array for embedded. We have data for Apple platforms. Inline array is also used on embedded. And finally, we have unsafe buffer pointer, which you really shouldn't use, right? Um, and if we look at this, it doesn't seem very efficient to me if you're while writing an embedded microcontroller. As Ben demonstrated, sometimes performance matter matters a lot, especially on these microcontrollers. And when you're writing cross-platform code for iOS and Android, I want to write it once and run it again. So today, um, or very recently anyways, today we have uh, Swift on Android coming up. And um, on Swift Package Index, they track all of the build support, like what packages support what platform, which is uh, pretty high, I think, 29, 27%, 28% or by now. after after a couple of months, which is pretty high if you com consider that only 40% of these packages are Linux, right? So three quarters of your packages already work on, a, on an Android phone today, um, which is great. You can use your packages right there, right now, and you don't need to, to do that much different than you did on the phone. This looks little, but like a lot of packages are like Swift UI and iOS and UI. So we don't care about those anyway. But what about embedded? So today, spans are not very well adopted. And there are still some patterns we have to figure out. But I think span is great for parsing data. We're not quite there yet for writing. So I'm working on some libraries to bring, uh, uh, I'm working on bringing my libraries to spans. Um, and yeah, I hope you do too. If you have any questions on how to implement that, let me know. But I really want to stress the point, we need, we need to, uh, bring bring our ecosystems together and make Swift like this whole holistic view where we write our code well. And I hope you agree with me. Thank you. <laughs>